Hi, Corey. Thanks for joining me today, friend. Hi, Tashin. Yeah, thanks for having me. Really nice to be here. So, um, you know, I've enjoyed your blog for some time and your online presence, and I actually haven't had a chance to join your classes yet, but I've been very happy those exist and uh, really just curious to learn more about you and your background and also the kinds of things that you offer. Um, but maybe we could just start with, I'd love to hear you introduce yourself and kind of hear more about your, your background and life story up to this point, to the extent that you want to share short, long, whatever, it's all good. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Um, yeah. My name is uh, Corey Ichigen. Uh, Hess Ichigen means one source, one origin. Um, and uh, I grew up in the Midwest. I'm a Midwest boy. Um, I grew up in Michigan. Um, pretty, pretty simple family, you know, pretty um, middle class, nothing special. Um, I was a really intense person. Um, always came in, I came in a little bit um, burning pretty hot, I think, really uh, curious about things and in a, in a, um, in a, in maybe a, a little bit of an over intense way. And um, yeah, we moved to Florida when I was 16. And um, that was a really good transition for me. Um, and then I went to school in Missoula, Montana. And that was, um, it was sort of this taste of wild, wild life that um, I sort of got into um, rock climbing. And uh, my friends and I were, were kind of uh, thought we were Jack Kerouac and, and, uh, and Gary Snyder. And um, I was going to be a writer. And uh, at a certain point, I realized that um, I really didn't have anything to write about. I didn't really have... Um, uh, clarity or or a deep experience to really um write about something and um and i felt like um in many ways um i couldn't really bring forth um anything really authentic through um uh through this body etc i was sort of going in in different directions at once sort of i want to go forward but i'm going backwards or I, I felt like I couldn't uh, express fully in, in general. Uh, my relationships with people were um, conflicted. I felt, um, you know, uh, I felt like I had a, a, a barrier between uh, myself and my relationships with life, with people. And, um, and then that all sort of culminated in this, um, like I was, uh, I was cleaning this ballet studio. I was, um, I'm a big athlete. I was a big athlete growing up and I was cleaning this ballet studio. I, we lived next to it and um, they let me do that so I could take classes. And while I was there, I had this sort of um, lockup in my pelvis. And, um, and uh, it was like, that was a, a, a clear indication of my inner, inner state. It is sort of locked up physically. And um, I was like, all this passion, all this, um, fascination but not really being able to let it through me and um and so um at that point i i went and i i started some practices uh i did some of the non-directed which maybe we'll talk about later and then um uh i ended up through this sort of a wall i hit i ended up contacting gary snyder the famous writer and gary um i i told gary i want to be a writer I want to um, um, go to Zen training of some kind. And um, he said, um, don't, don't go to Japan yet, go to this place on Whidbey Island. And so somehow the Zen had um, sort of hit me in this way that I thought, oh, this is a path for me to be able to process some of this stuff, this physical, this um, wall I had hit in my life. And, um, and, and so I went out there and I had all these ideas about Zen and um, I went out there to Whidbey Island, which is where I live now. And I met the, the head monk and um, it was totally different than what I had imagined. It was like this, uh, uh, um, what was it? It was, it was this Spartan, uh, tough, um, sharp, um, beautiful, but intense. It wasn't this sweet, you know, um, nice place. It was this intense environment. The head monk was sort of like this beautiful, um, charismatic, like looked like a movie star, but was like 
really sharp, saw right through me. The things he said just cut me. Just oh, it was very sharp, and I just got the hell out of there. No way, I'm I'm getting out of here. I'm I'm I'm, I'm this isn't for me. And uh, and and I went traveling around, and I was in um, different places in Cuba, and I realized oh, I can't really be here right now. I'm in Cuba. This is a a an amazing situation. Um, why am I not present here? Why can't I physically be here and be harmonious in um, this place I'm completely fascinated with? And I realized at that point that it, it really was this inner experience I needed to explore. So it, it, no matter what I would do externally, that didn't matter. It had to be this internal um, experience of, of a meeting in unity. And uh, I went back to the States and somehow I, I rolled back to... Um, to the place on Whidbey, Tahoma One Drop, and I um, somehow they let me go back, back there. And when I got there, the Roshi was there, and um, and meeting him was just life changing. It was it was it was life changing. Uh, meeting someone um, of such a um, a master, a, a degree of attainment. I don't know about attainment, and a de uh, uh, and this this place of of true impact in your life. Oh, I've met this person. This shows me the possibility of how I can actually relate with life. And that shook me. And, um, but I didn't go yet. I, no, I'm not going yet. And um, eventually what happened was, I, after fighting with Zen training, I don't want to go do this Zen training. I don't want to do this Zen training. Um, I was in a retreat on Whitby and day six was 9-11. And 9-11, um, um, you know, we got, the head monk walked in, said the two planes had crashed mm -hmm. and uh, people were there from New York. And um, at that point, I, I knew that there something had to be, ha there something had to change. And so that got me over the, 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 you know, the lip to get into finally pulling the trigger to go to Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll backtrack now. Go ahead. I'll stop. Oh, please, please feel free to keep going if, if you'd like, or. Yeah. So, so, you know, I was a really intense guy. I was, I need, I had some real deep questions. This is in, in, in um, Zen, this is referred to as the great doubt. It's this, it's this question, this, um, not even question, it's this profound um, necessity to encounter life and meet it and open up to it. It is, it's an idea. It's not something you can build. It's, 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 it's this, and in, through my training, I, over time, I saw, oh, it was really that the universe was, was um, trying to open me up the whole time. And so, um, so I went to Japan and, and then, uh, and then I was on a conveyor belt of, of training with the Roshi. So, yeah. <laughs> you described yourself as a child before any of the exposure to Zen as, as being kind of intense, what, what exactly was that like for you? Um, I think, I think, you know, kids are so open, you know, I have three daughters, they're, um, you know, they're it, they're just it, you know, and um, there, there really isn't this um, filter up for them between, you know, this energetic, whatever this is in life, they're, they're, the, the filter's not there yet. And that's uh, so beautiful. And um, I think for me, I, I had I had certain openings, certain uh, uh, clairvoyance stuff would, would come in for me. I, I would, um, would know what was going to happen before it would happen. I was, I could kind of um, read people in this profound way. Um, uh, I ended up having some experiences with sports that showed me deeper realities were um, sort of just right there below the surface of my, and I, I didn't really find anyone around me who, um, who, who knew how to talk about that or, or who really showed any interest in it. And so I felt in that way, uh, somewhat alone, somewhat isolated. Um, we weren't really religious. I, I was drawn to, you know, any kind of religion, honestly. And um, I still, I still do love, love religion and um, spirituality and all of its flavors. And um, yeah, so I think there was a part of me that kind of knew, oh, I have to open up to this from a very early age. And, and yet I didn't really have any tools yet 
to do that. Hmm. Hmm. And what did you notice about the Roshi when you met him? What, what exactly was that like that his presence demonstrated these qualities that you admired? Yeah, um, well, the Roshi, one thing I would say about him is, is, okay, he is like five foot tall, you know, he's, he's a little, little man, you know, but um, he's so um, profoundly physically present. And, um, and his voice is, you know, this strange voice, you know, this super deep voice and you're what, this like sort of outer space. Where am I? This little tiny man is, you know, is, is speaking so deeply. And, and, and yet I felt in his presence, I felt like all of those filters, like they, they were seen through. I was with him and um, he was penetrating. His presence was penetrating all of those filters. So there I, there was uh you know, core, core, the pure kind of um, Corey, and then there was the Roshi, and he was seeing that, and and I could tell he can see that, and uh, and for for me to meet somebody like that, first time I'd ever met anyone like that, who um, I felt, oh, I feel, I feel seen, I see, I feel felt, um, and not in an intellectual way, I feel profoundly um, rooted in this experience. Um, very bewildering at first. And um, so I said, you know, why, he kind of knew I was like a, um, you know, I, I was a species he could understand, you know, mm -hmm. kind of a wild animal like him. And, and, um, and so he kind of, you know, he could see, okay, this guy, he's a, he's a potential um, so Genji person. And mm -hmm. I said, well, why, why would somebody like me go to Japan, you know, and train with you? you know what do you think you know and um, I kind of well you know um, I think it's different for everyone but I, you know I'm curious what you would think you know and he's mm, you know and he said it's to realize why you were born you know and um, you know for me that was it was I had I had no um, I had no answer I had I had nowhere no foothold there wasn't a foothold to uh, react to and and say something you know, so you're, you're there and then oh, you're fully seen, you're, you've been um, sort of overthrown by this sort of truth, you know, and, um, and, and the Rushi's like that. He's, um, he's got such power um, to his presence. Um, it, it's as if he's this, he's really this, this um, vessel for this um, uh, truth coming through him. And, and, and so, so that was what I encountered with, with, with him with that. And I just, I didn't know any, I didn't know what to do with it. And so I, I sat for the rest of the retreat, there were four more days in the retreat. And I sat in one of these chairs, you know, these, these ones with your knees and, you know, and um, I was in agony. I was this sort of energetic problem. I would joke this sort of key problem, like I'm, I'm full of energy, but it's all going in five directions. Mm. Uh, the end i had this you know experience where like i swallowed my brain you know sort of stopped breathing and i mm. you know i hear everyone's thoughts you know and it was just like a carrot like a carrot like okay core you know this is real you uh you can go to this for a for a long time and uh and, and so that really uh something a seed really got planted with with that experience with the roshi mm. yeah Hmm. Yeah. And when you went to go to Japan and trained at Sogenji, what was that like for you? Uh, you know, some for those that might not know what training there is like, can you kind of paint a picture of what that was for you? Yeah. Um, so, so like all of your decoration, all of your cuteness, all of your um all the things that you're 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 good at, that you all the skills you use to um, move through the world, you know that I'm 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 really smart. I'm the smartest one in the room all the time. You know um, that that doesn't matter there. You're you're there and you you shave your head, you wear these old clothes, and um, you get up at three twenty three thirty. You, you, your, your whole day is, is, um, 
this choreography of physical um, dance of 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 you're 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 walking here you're sitting you're running you're chopping you're there's a choreography to it and at first you you really can't you don't understand how to do that choreography and um and and so there are you know strict meal times obviously strict sitting times um anywhere from five hours to 18 hours a day of sitting you're seeing the roshi um, in this uh, individual meeting called uh, Sanzen or Dokusan, um, Doku means uh, single, and you see him, and um, that's the center of the life there. Like you wake up and you go to the chant, and then you go see the Roshi. So you've been preparing since you saw him the night before. You've been preparing to see him in the morning. So your whole life is is based around going to see him, and um, you know, trying to bring it, trying to bring your, your experience through. And, um, and he sees you very clearly and he sees where you're caught. And he, um, and, and the Roshi is this, um, he's, he's this incredible combination of the most badass person you'll ever meet, like the scariest, most badass person. Okay. And he's, he can be incredibly gentle. So he's so badass that you're not, um, that he doesn't have to be um, profoundly um, mean, right? He's, he's just encouraging most of us at first. He's so powerful that he's, he's just throwing energy at you, throwing energy at you. And you, you learn how to take that, you learn how to take that. So you're, you're, you go there, you're super insecure at first. And then over time, you, you learn how to fill up with this, learn how to fill up with that. And then he can be mean later, you know, when you're ready. He can, he can push those buttons when you're ready, but mostly he's, he's basically grandmotherly. He's very um, supportive at, for you at first. So it's made people think of Zen as being this harsh environment where, um, you know, you're just sort of um, suffering the whole time. Instead, it's, you're filled up. You learn to be filled up by the life. Um, I would say people at Sogenji are, um, they're like, um, you know, they're wild artists, many of them. They're um, counterculture. They're um, they often they've been through some kind of wild experience that brings them there. They're burning hot in this strange way, and they've come to this from wherever you know Denmark, um, India, um, Mexico, the States, Canada, you know, all over Eastern Europe. They've come there to find someone to learn how to process. Um, some profound um, opening they've had. Often that's the experience there. I'm so full of energy, it's gonna kill me unless I figure it out. I'm gonna go work with this energy master who can help me open up to it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so very, it's, 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 and I think, you know, so Genji is not quite the level of the Sodo in Japan where um, so Genji has, it has some leeway here and there. The Roshi has been, um, I think, very skillful at uh, giving some um, room for Westerners to, um, you know, dance a little bit with it. And, um, and so that was really profoundly helpful for me. I needed a little room to be able to explore there. And uh, he's found, I think, a sweet spot with that. Um, so, so yeah, um, the life is, you know, it's very Spartan. You have these, again, you have these clothes on, you're sitting all the time, you're um, cold, you're cold in the winter, you're basically living outside. Um, your, your food is um, not that great, you know, you crave sweets, you, you, you know, and I, it, there's, a, there's a real um, undercurrent of, of deep rebelliousness there. This, this environment is deeply rebellious, and that's actually very much encouraged in a certain way because, honestly, in order for us to really open up in our training, there's a you have to be able to break through these stuck ideas of, of how life is. And, and so the whole life there is this, what they call kufu, creative opening. We, we learn to creatively open up in our zazen, creatively open up in the work, and, and that creates these profoundly creative people. So it's, that's what the life's like a lot. They're rebellious, creative. Hmm. Hmm. Seems like uh, from the descriptions you've had of Sanzen, it, it almost to me sounds as like you're 
like your nervous system is sort of dancing with the Roshi's nervous system and like you're learning from his and he's seeing you and and kind of there's this like interchange over time. Does that seem like a fair description? Yes. Um, I'm kind of, my language is energy. That's mm -hmm, what I, mm -hmm. how I like to talk. And mm -hmm. I don't know if that's the only language, but that's how I generally talk about it. And mm -hmm. I don't, mean, um, and so like how we relate physically and how we relate with the environment, I like to use the word energy. Mm -hmm. And that is, that isn't, um, I don't think that's the only right way to talk about it. But for me, we meet the Roshis, um, what they call Ba, this energetic field. So mm -hmm. his mind is in the room and he's presenting his mind to us. And we come in and um, like a cloud of confusion, we run into this mind, okay? And running into this mind, the Roshi feels that, and he's, you know, you're caught, you're, you're scattered, you're divided, okay? And he can feel that, those me that meeting of, of that. This, um, and so over time, um, in this kind of under the table, exchange of okay my nervous system or this um my mind my energetic field is entrained to open up to what he's giving me under the table this mm -hmm. energetic field he's presenting my nervous system my um uh mind my uh key my chi starts to um be able to be guided by that opened up and and through that then you start to really see what Sanzen's about. It's this, it's this dialogue of meeting of these kind of soups. Yeah. So, so yes, you do. You, it's under the table. There's the, the talking is usually um, not even secondary. It's down the line, you mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Yeah. What was it like for you to begin to notice that sort of under the table quality or, or uh, to learn how to dance that dance or play that game? Yeah. Well, um, you know, at first, you know, I would go in and um, and I, I would I would often be very emotional. You're very emotional first with with it's powerful. It's very powerful. Um, you're working so hard. You're you're trying so hard. You you want to outduel that guy. You go in. You want to outduel him, and, and he outduels you. You know, he gets you. You know, and you're, I want to show him I can do it. You know, and um, and you're, and you're working so hard, you've been sitting, it's painful. The Zazen is hard for a lot of people. It's, you're going through all of your stuff, all your stuff comes up, all this um, clearing all the, you know, as you go deep, all the stuff comes up. And, um, and you meet him and, and, and all that stuff's there and it's, there, there's no hiding, there's no hiding from it. And over time, that stuff starts to change. That um, non-intellectual aspect starts to kind of uh, harmonize and change, and your whole being starts to come into oneness. And I think you do want to talk about the Sasokon at some point. But the Sasokon is this breathing aspect that you're learning from him in Sanzen. And um, the traditionally, it's this this exhale, this long exhale. Okay, and first you can't do it. You're like, <laughs> you know, and you're kind of. Oh, I'm trying to breathe out, but my whole system wants to go back. And, and so, so what happens with this, um, you bring your Sissoka onto him and he's, he can see, oh, that there's a big division in, in that person's, in this field. And over time, that Sissoka starts to smooth out. And then your awareness unifies through this unifying of the breath. This, oh, this field, I start to bring this field that's more clear. And the Roshi can feel, oh, there's, there's clarity there. There's, I'm meeting more clarity. And, and so it's both our own process of, of bringing this clarity. And then also we start to be able to feel him more. Oh, I can, ah, where, where there's a hard edge there, where I'm meeting um, the Roshi. If I soften there, I can really feel him. Like I start to feel his clarity coming at me rather than him just being meeting me at the door. Like, okay, get out of here, you know. With so, um, so this is Sokon and the um, unifying of your whole being. That's um, starts to be this this beautiful dialogue there in Sanzen, and and 
And then that's where things start to deepen. So, so that technique, you're, you're extending the exhale, it's, it's long and then relaxed inhales and you do that. And at first it's, it's terrible and really hard. Uh, yeah. What are sort of the, the milestones with that practice after that? Well, I think, so, so what happens with the Sissoko is that you start to go into Samadhi states. This naturally happens. When the energy starts to flow, you, you start to drop you start to go into samadhi states. This is just natural. It's not, they're not special. It's just when the body, when the whole being starts to go into unified, um, become into oneness, then naturally these things show up. And so, um, you know, the Roshi can see that very clearly. He can see, oh, this person's like, when they're looking at me, I feel this samadhi coming through their eyes at me. You know, he, it, this is um, very clear. At a certain point, the person is um, their whole. You, you see them walking, and it's very powerful. Is is very normal to see this, where this um, person who had come to training, sort of walking, uh, you know, can barely walk around in, in unity. To the, oh, that their whole being is beautiful. It's like something is different there, and um, and and so I think the milestones are like for one thing, you know the breath starts to lengthen. It starts to lengthen all the time. I, I'm, I'm cooking and this is so calm, it's just ha happening. I'm chopping vegetables. This is so calm, it's just happening. I'm sweeping and this is so calm, it's happening. I focus on anything and this is so calm, it's happening. The focus and the breath start to become one whole thing, okay? And um, we'll also say that, um, you know, different things happen with the breath um, and, the tondin is a huge aspect of that. This lower dantian tondin, this tondin breath. Um, this is this could take up a whole conversation, but the tondin is a is a huge part of this uh, sissokan. As the tondin develops, the breath develops. The, the the extension starts to happen as the the body fills up through the the belly through the lower dantian. Um, so it's it's a the tondin is this um, innate innate unifying aspect that you you sort of just um, learn to um, catch a ride on and, and use in the training rather than this stereotype of kind of force idea that people have about the Tandon or about Sissokan. It's not that they're the, the actual Sissokan, it, the way they describe it is descriptive of the internal process that starts to happen. The breath lengthen, lengthens on its own starts to happen. Yeah, yeah. And um, I want to ask you about your experience working on, on Mu and what, what point did the Roshi switch you from doing Sissokan to working on Mu? I was a long time on Sissokan. Mm -hmm. I was two years, mm -hmm. two years on Sissokan. Mm -hmm. You know, you hear about people, they get koan, you know, you get your koan the first week. <laughs> this is not the style, you mm -hmm. know, this is um, I, Sissokan, people could do Sissokan training um, forever. You know, it's not like, well, you know, you kind of get that, that's the beginner phase, and then you jump onto the real stuff. Not mm -hmm. at all, mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. all. So, um, you know, I, I, yeah, so I was there like two years. I was there two years on Sissokan. And that's, that's like sitting, you know, a lot mm -hmm. every day. San, sans in every day for two years, you know, maybe, you know, Three three hundred and forty sansans a year, you know, mm -hmm. of days a year. So that's twice a day of three. You know, that's a lot of sansans. So um, that just shows how profound that um, Sissokan really is. It's mm -hmm. you know, so two years, and then I got onto Mu, and um, the Mu, the Mu Koan, um, which everyone I'm sure knows. Um, Maybe you has, could say just a little of, about it in case people haven't. Uh, it would be useful. Yeah, well, you know, it's does a monk asked Master Joshu, does the dog have Buddha nature? And Joshu replied, Moo. Mm -hmm. And um, like, like right now, any intellectual idea you just had about that, anyone who's listening, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. Like any intellectual concept that you just put on that, that um, is like the opposite of what we're talking about. And um, 
And so the, the Mu Koan is this unifying um, Samadhi unifying um, tool. So just as the Sokan start took us deep into um, the, the Samadhi, the, the Mu is this tool that takes us further into this unification, this energetic unification process. So you're doing the moo, you're doing the moo, you're doing the moo. It isn't like, yes, no, moo is like technically no, but that's like not at all. But so you're doing this moo all day, moo, moo. You're, you're, it's in your head in this moo, moo. And you're first you're like, well, all oh, the moo. Um, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I just do this moo, I do this moo. Um, and then um, I get exhausted and I, then I can, you know, whatever, do whatever I want to do you know um and then over time as this as it sort of develops through the body this this move um process then you're you're there and you hear a bird cry and it, it comes out moo or you're you're eating and um you're you're you like you pick up your hand and it's it's moo like your your movement is moo you um you you're there with someone and you accidentally moo comes out you um you're sleeping and you're dreaming moo you um you start to be able to see the moo it starts to develop around you oh that's moo but i can see it like this is a full-on energetic transformation process and um and so it's a unification it's a it's a way to bring the whole system everything into this um unification um and then at a certain point Traditionally, with the mukoan, um, someone hits a profound um, breakthrough. Um, it's as if they have um, gone to this place of uh, the cells have transformed, have met reality, and then truly meeting reality, touching this great life energy. There's there's a, a, a an explosion of opening, and and that's often what happens with the mukoan. Mm. And um, that was my experience. Um, mm -hmm. Was feeling down to uh, every fiber and then touching like the main line and then then opening like the bucket shatters. Like this isn't an idea. It's a real uh, felt sense experience of opening up to everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And maybe I want to come back to your experience of that, but just to ask a couple of clarifying questions first. Um, my sense is uh, that there are, like several of these sort of equivalent koans that are sort of like initial or or, or breakthrough koans and mu is one of them is that correct um yeah although you know i don't i don't really know that much about that to be mm -hmm. honest like i never did um the hakuin's one hand i never mm -hmm. did that mm -hmm. i don't think i did maybe i did but but it wasn't the mu was like that was it that mm -hmm. was like you know i'm still the mu is still there for me mm -hmm. so it's like um that was kind of yeah so there are like hakuin's what is the sound of one hand is is a famous breakthrough koan mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah and uh sort of from the way you're describing it and how i've heard it in the past it, it seems to me like the way that you would practice it is sort of uh just establish the syllable in your mind as you do this asokan and kind of stay out of intellectual conceptualization and just try to do that 24 seven all of the time. Uh, is, is that a fair description of, of how you actually do that technique? Um, yeah, um, <clears throat> there's, a, there's, there, you know, there are a lot of questions about that, you know, mm -hmm. and I, I hear a lot of questions. People ask me, is the moo on the out breath, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. And, um, you know, it's hard to talk about mm -hmm. because as the system starts to deeply unify samadhi states start to um take over and then the whole system becomes flows in oneness everything starts to come through in oneness and so um like are you doing it with the out breath yes but are you also doing it you know it's hard to there it's hard to even bring a division in there like you know uh where where are you not doing it ever no you know so it's, it's always there it's always there and um yeah, I would say um, 
you know, it's not real. You know, it's it moo is it? It's not real. It, but it's a it's a way to bring the whole system um, through usher it through this this dualism um, in a non mental way, in a physical way. The tandan, the tandan energy, is part of the deal with unifying the whole system. So it's a whole um, marriage of tandan unification, mu, susokon, they all bring the whole system into oneness. And so I, I don't think we can even divide it into, um, I, which people like to do. Well, what am I thinking about? What am I, am I, um, is it, you know, you can't even say it's mental or non-mental at a certain point because it's just what's happening, you know? Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. And uh, you have a, post that I think this is the first post I've read of yours, which was breaking through sublime and natural. And that's where you talk about your experience breaking through the moo. And I, I just love that post. And um, so, so many of them are good, but that one's just so wonderful. And one of the things that surprised me about it is just that you wrote it at all. I mean, a lot of people, um, yeah, I mean, I have so many questions, but a lot of people don't write about their experiences of this thing. And it's sort of, in some traditions, it's, it's sort of like, you shouldn't talk about this sort of thing. And then, um, yeah, on the other hand, people on the internet, all kinds of people say all kinds of things about their practice. And so I'm curious why you decided to write about it and, and, and uh, how you view that. And, and also, yeah, what was it like and why did you decide to write about it? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I think that's really interesting. I think, um, you know, several reasons, honestly, for me. Um, one reason was that there's a, there's a lot of talk out there on, um, koan. There's a lot of talk about Zen, you know, you've got, uh, this cat poster talks about Zen, you know what I mean? There's so much talk about this toothpaste, Zen toothpaste, you know what I mean? And, and, and so, you know, I kind of wanted to, you know, nobody was asking, but I kind of wanted to, okay, nobody's asking me, but I'm going to write this. I'm going to write this and, and say, this is real. You know, this is, this is not like a concept. This is not like someone zenning out. You know, this is a, a, um, this is a real thing that people do. You know, dudes like me who, you know, are like normal guys, intense, but normal guys can go and they can have a profound um, life-changing um, training. And so I know what you mean about, like, I'm sure there are people like, why did you write that? You know, and, um, and, and I get that. But I think there's just, there's, it was maybe just to add to the conversation. There's enough fluff out there that I wanted to bring, okay, this is like, this is real. This is real, what happens here? Also, um, I would say just to, to say a little bit about my blog um you know when you when you i think after these big experiences or after training um i think that you um you have you've gone through something which needs expressing needs to be coming through and um uh you're you're sort of this you become this creative being and um and also there's this need to be able to try to offer yourself out to people. Like um, you've seen something so indebted to this experience to, you know, for me, the Buddha or even just the universe to, I, I felt such a great need to be able to try to offer myself to be helpful. And, um, and that's a little messy. It's a little bit messy for a while. And that's part of why the integration process of like, you don't go teach, after you've had a big experience, you, you take a while because it's a messy process of learning how to actually present yourself. And um, for me, the blog was partly a way for me to um, creatively explore how to put myself out there. And um, like I tried for a while, like, well, I'll be the next, you know, guy on YouTube giving talks, you know, mm. and it felt awful. It felt mm. awful. And so, um, it felt like, well, I'm just like, I'm causing karma here. I'm creating problems, you know? And so through the writing um, for, for years, for a few years, I really had to be like, okay, is this dripping with essence? Is this real? 
And, and so I would feel that and then, okay, I can put this out. Uh, and so that was a way for me to clarify my whole experience outwardly. It was a tool to clarify it and to put it out. And so um, that was what the blog really has been about is bringing that, um, it, if it's not true, it's, you know, it's, it, it's kind of in the, in the, in, you know, in my drafts, you know, <laughs> delete, Definitely. You, know, so, you know, so how can I really bring something that feels real? And, and so that's part of what the experience has been like for me with the blog mm-hmm. and writing the Moo, the Moo one. Yeah. I think I just wanted it to be um, part of the conversation, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh and, and, you know, people can go and read that post and it's wonderful, but would you mind just recounting verbally what that was like for you to, to break through with the Moo? Yeah. Um, so, um, so yeah, after, after um, I was on the Moo for about, MooCon for about a year mm-hmm. and, um, and that was, um, that's, that was, yeah. So, so in, in training, um, there are all these ideas like, I'm gonna stay up all night. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just stay up all night every night until I break through, you know? Um, I'm gonna go for it, I'm gonna do it, you know? And, um, and then they try to do that. And then it's just totally, um, it, it implodes. It's a bad situation. You, you know, you're, you're so, um, you're trying so hard, but you're not really in this process. And so as, uh, as I, I kind of kept going deeper into the, the, the training and the moo, um, some things started to flow for me, some big, huge um, um, transference, transparency, um, started to come through my system things started to flow i i um the energy started to really open up for me um and and in that um you know it went from me going in and um being like i'm trying to do the moo but i am like i can't get it through i can't it can't come through and then things started to open i was head of the chance for uh, six months, that's a a term we we call densu. And the chanting really helped me to open up my body to express outwardly. Okay, that was something that was really hard for me. I was was, um, really restricted in here. I couldn't couldn't let it out. And um, and so I did that for for a while and opened up this whole channel. And um, and so the densu was a real wonderful way for me to start to bring that move outward. Oh, okay, and then um, and then at a certain point, um, it's this whole creative process. You think you're doing one thing, and then this whole process starts to happen through your system, through your system. And you're, I would go see the Roshi, and I would uh, yell the moo, and then um, we would just laugh. We would just laugh in there and 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 cry and. And it would no idea what was going on. So you're in this transformation process you can't really understand. And then um, I was sitting up. I wasn't laying down. So I was saying this about people think, well, they're just going to sit up. They're going to just stay up all night. Well, at a certain point, it started to make sense for me to try to just sit up at night. So I sat up. I didn't lay down. Um, and that c- helped create a whole process of opening in my system that helped the move kind of come through more and more. And I don't recommend that to people. It's part of a process. So um, like, don't try to leap to that. That's not appropriate. Um, but for me, at a certain point, it was really happening. And I was opening up through my standing quite a bit. I'm, I do this um, uh, non-directed and this jam jong and, and things were really opening for me. Um, and, uh, and I just went into this place of, of, of sharpening and, and um, opening and becoming more and more open. And, uh, you know, at a certain point, um, it all came to, to, to a head. It all came to fruition. And I had a, a huge experience um, as I was walking into Sanzen um, one day and, and um, 
yeah, I, I don't think I want to talk too much about that exactly right now, but it, I would just say it was a part of a whole process that, that, that erupted um, and through, and it's a very, very beautiful, um, honest, delicate, fragile, vulnerable process. And then you, you, after that, you're kind of, um, you're like a newborn baby. You, you, you don't really know how to function. You, mm. you, you're like, oh, I raised my arm, you know, or, what's that, you know? Mm. So you, everything is new, everything is new. So, and then you have this whole time of ripening for a long time, you know? Um, but yeah, and then, then you went on to koan training is after that. So you do mm -hmm. some checks. There are these checks you do and, um, you know, the Roshi checks you on these things, but he knows. And then you go on to these koan. And, and just to say real quick about that, I think that you need to have a breakthrough experience to do koan. So I don't think people can do the koan without doing having a breakthrough experience. It's a key which opens the koan, hmm. the rest of the koan curriculum. So jumping into koan training or, or kind of uh, working on koans before you've had that, I think it's usually intellectual. That's my feeling about it. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, yeah. yeah. What, what was the role of the standing and the non-directed standing in bringing that about for you? Like, what, um, tell me about your experience with those things and, and what those were like for you. Um, so, so going back to um, my, my early time with Zazen, um, you know, Zazen is, you know, it's this real testing ground. You sit down, you're, you're there and you're, you're trying to do this thing and you can't. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes you can really open up Sometimes you can breathe. Often you can't, you know. Often you're just there um, having no idea what to do or things open up sometimes. Like, well, I really feel, I really felt something there, you know. And then the next time you sit and you're like, I just feel like I'm locked up or I'm confused or there's this place that's just totally rigid in my system I can't process. You don't have the tools to feel what's going on. And, um, and so I think Zazen takes, I think Zazen takes a couple of years. It takes a couple of years to actually learn how to do it and um, like doing it a lot, you know? And, um, and for me, I had two practices. I had one called um, Jam John, which is with Z's. Okay. And I learned that from another monk at the monastery named Daiko, Daiko, uh, Peter Skogard. And Peter's a, uh, uh, a teacher in Denmark, Copenhagen. And I like, if anybody's there, you should go meet Peter uh, Daiko. Um, and um, so I learned that from him. And what the ZZ is, what the Jam Jong is, is in our context of our, um, my, you know, Zen meditation context for me, what it was is um, it's a way to align the body, a way to um, uh, feel this, uh, inner momentum of energy through the body and um, learn how to also feel where we're stuck and release those stuck places. Like a kinked hose, the, C, the ZZ, so you stand in these like, you know, you stand in these poses, okay? And you think, well, I can do that. And you do it for five minutes and then you start, okay, I'm getting tired or this is starting to be uncomfortable. And so at that point, those, those um, normally you're using these muscles maybe inappropriately. And at that point we have to relax and then the body starts to organize itself from the inside out. The energy starts to flow from the inside out as you relax and then you can hold your arms up. You can stand there in these difficult postures. And so the ZZ is, um, it's a way that creates friction in the system where you then have to encounter and learn how to open up these stuck places, energetic, physical. Um, and, and, and so this inner sophistication starts to happen, okay? This momentum starts to happen through the system. And that momentum also butts up against these stuck places and, and like knocking on the door, it's, it shows, oh, okay that helps me to open them, it, that, that knocking against that helps them to open. 
Um, so that was, it's sort of a um, structured, um, it's clear, you're supposed to do it this way. You're supposed to stand this way. Your posture is supposed to look like this. So in that way, it was very structured for me, very, very good, very helpful. Um, and then the opposite, not opposite, but the other side of that for me was I did this practice called uh, non-directed body movement. And I started this in when I was in Missoula. Um, and the idea behind that um, is that you just stand there and if your body, okay, you stand there and you forget all ideas of how you should be um, holding yourself, how the energy should be happening, how you should be breathing. And at first it's sort of like um, old, old trauma starts to kind of come up through the system. Like, why is my arm moving? You know, my arm is moving. I didn't plan that. And, um, and what you do is this little editor will come and he'll say, don't do that. You're supposed to be standing right. You're supposed to have good posture. And so the idea, the rule with the non-directed is that you, you, you kind of suspend that editor. You suspend that plan, that strategy for a little bit. And, um, you know, different things come up, super emotional things come up. I had where I, I experienced the cord wrapped around my neck at birth, all this stuff came up and, um, and, and, and then it, it deepened, it deepened, it deepened. And I saw over time that through the non-directed, it was a sort of amoral way for me to get into my body. Like I had all these you know, maybe good ideas, like, well, it's supposed to be this way in my body, you know? And so I would bring that to the standing and that would lock my body down. And so in order to really open up to feeling and letting the body open, I had to let go of that good idea. And, and that started to change things. The energy started to open up. I really started to feel my tendon. Oddly enough, in the non-directed, that's where the tendon really started to just show up. And then perhaps for another conversation, that's where the, um, the non-directed started to bleed into my uh, relating with life, with people. Whereas, oh, where I had created this idea of, of interacting, that had actually blocked really being open to what's happening. And so the non-directed became a whole, um, it's, 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 it's been, I would say, as important as anything else in my life for um, really relating and deepening my practice. So those two things, non-directed and the ZZ, they really fed the zazen. I would get to the cushion and there would be all this momentum in my system. And I would have an internal language, internal sophistication for, oh, okay, I can let go there. There's a whole process trying to happen. If I, if I get out of the way, that's all opening up. So that's what, that's what happened with those two. And to be honest, they're all the same for me now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Same. Yeah. Sort of merged. Yeah, that makes sense. That yeah. makes sense. Um, one of the questions I've had for a long time about Zazen is like, it seems very common that people have all kinds of difficulties with it when they start of uh, at the very least like physical pain or, you know, agitation or, or lots of thoughts and so on. And it seems like over time that shifts and it, it develops a life of its own and uh, isn't so painful and it's even enjoyable and delightful. And how do, how do you think about how that shifts over time and like, uh, you know, what happens with, for example, the pain over time, if, if people tend to experience that at the beginning, what kinds of shifts happen for people in Zazen over time? Um, yeah, well, you know, in some ways we're getting into our bodies. Mm -hmm. We're getting into our bodies. And I, that this is part of the, the, what I love about the Zen training is it's, it's like simple, like, like we're becoming more and more simple. We're becoming more in our bodies, you know, and in the, in the monastery, you're there and, um, you know, you start to you salivate when you smell the rice, mm -hmm. you know, you become more and more physically real, physically and, um, present. And, and so, um, part of what happens in the, in the, the Zazen is that, um, you know, we just get into our bodies. Our body isn't this thing over there that I sort of have to deal with, like, oh, that, you know, that knee's bothering me again. You know, I'm, I'm going to have to deal with that now, you know? Mm -hmm. so, 
so that partly that just happens the unification of of this whole you know process starts to happen also i feel honestly that our bodies want to do zazen i feel like um this is not like someone's like good idea that they they well, I think people should sit like this. And that's a really good concept for them to, you know, well, that concept's really smart. You know, no, it's that someone was sitting, you know, on some rock and they started to open up. The body wants to open up. It's, it's, a, it's deeper than, um, than, than, than someone's idea of, of meditation's good. It, you know, so, and, and I also would say, that the meditation, the ZZ, they're, they're also not real. They're not real. You're standing there, you're sitting there, there are different postures for feeling what's really going on, what's really going on. And that, again, that's, that's like the universe shining through us. It's not a concept of um, someone invented, uh, like, I think it'd be really smart if people sat more in this position. I, I, that, that, it's deeper than that, you know? Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think people get in, people start to, because that's naturally what our bodies want to open up and in, in that these positions, they are, they're really good ones to open up to the universe and what's trying to happen all the time. Hmm. Hmm. And we're in pain at first because, you know, and people have pain throughout, but we're in pain, especially at first, because we, you know, again we're divided we're 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 um part of us is trying to go forward part of us is trying to go back and that creates um a pressure cooker situation and so part of what people do in zazen is they start to get everything i joke you know that we're like a cart with horses and um you know 10 horses and, and some of those horses are going back and sideways and up and down you know and over time all the horses sort of okay they're going one direction and the whole system feels harmonious you know and so that's part of what happens you know mm -hmm. so it seems like that unification not maybe not that there wouldn't be pain ever or something but that it would sort of diminish the the pain that comes from being in different directions i, th I think so yeah i think so yeah yeah and it, it sounds like you're saying as well that the zazen and and zz or the chanting or um you know the non-directed body movement all of these things are just sort of occasions to open up to the same process yeah that's mm -hmm. what i think yeah mm -hmm. that um, makes sense yeah um in in yeah i i mean i feel that the the um the universe does zazen i feel like the universe does the zz i feel you know I, in i think at, at a certain point it just became clear to me that um you know, there's something bigger going on. And my job is to, um, you know, let that through and let in, in and that's what actually helps people too. Hmm. So. Mm. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, is there, I'm sort of torn because I'm curious to hear more about the koan training past move, but also you're like, yeah, if, if you hadn't had that breakthrough, it's, not so useful, but, uh, you know, feel free to say, no, nah, not too much to say about that, but is there anything you would like to say about what the koan training was like for you? Um, well, um, yeah, I can talk a, a little bit about it, um, mm -hmm. just for fun. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, we really are sort of, for me, for me, when I, when I, went through that and then I was working with the Cohen like um really are kind of living in this magical realm and I started to be able to you get a koan from a master maybe Gosa Hohen or something and um and there I started to you get into the koan and there's Gosa Hohen I'm 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 interacting with Gosa Hohen Gosa Hohen is there and and the process of the koan brings you into um, being able to be opened by Gosa Hoan's consciousness. And so then you, you, you open up to that and um, eventually after being wrong, uh, you know, a bunch, you go in and the Roshi sees it. Actually, Gosa Hoan is walking in the door. You, you become Gosa Hoan and, and you walk in and the Roshi sees, oh, that's Gosa Hoan. I can, I can feel that. And um, so that's pretty what I want to say about that, 
that key is that in order to really connect with that, um, that aspect, in order to really become Gosohoan, you, you have to have gone through that gone through that opening and then this magical realm is there that when then it's not magical as in um you know uh too out there but it's 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 right there and so but you have to have made a, a that kind of leap through that to be able to connect with these these different um masters um and um <clears throat> yeah and so so i i like to say this that with the Roshi, you you learn how to go from a place of having no idea what's going on. Like, I have no idea what is going on right now with the Roshi, and yet I'm opening up to some kind of wisdom. Like, I'm here and something incredible, something beautiful is coming through this interaction with the Roshi. And you start to be able to learn how to open up to his state of mind, Okay, I've I've become the Roshi state of mind, and that ability to bring this wisdom through not understanding that then transfers to the koan. It's like, oh, I have no idea what's going on, and th there's a skill that starts to develop and ripen through not knowing what's going on, but this wisdom starts to come through, and that's very unique. It's very interesting, very foreign to, I think, most of how we, we want to figure everything out. And the, the, the real Zen training, it's about you, you start to, oh, this, this wisdom is coming through if I connect with this, um, this you know, unknown. And, um, and so that's part of what happens with the con. You have no idea what's going on, and you have to go into that, and then <clears throat> something comes through that's... Um, this wisdom uh, bubbles up through that. Um, and then there is also the go, the capping phrases, which I would say they are further, you go further into that, which is an, a whole conversation too. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the, the koan um, training is magical, very magical. Um, it's not intellectual at all. And, um, and I, I'm trying to hammer that through to, to the <laughs> <listeners. laughs> Yeah, great, great, great. You know, one of the things that's struck me about the way you're describing this and also through your blog is, um, oh, I don't know how to put this, but something like, I mean, you talk about how it's really important to like fall in love with the training. And um, there was a similar thing that supported, sort of surprised me about your descriptions of the Roshi of like, he, the way that you describe him just sounds very sweet and loving and like you're like a almost like almost like a playmate or something it's like here's someone that I can play with and uh just this very sweet kind person um who's very intense of course but not um you know some some descriptions I've heard of him he sounds like mean and intimidating and uh I think I I would be scared of him uh, you know if I met him personally just knowing myself um but for you it sounded like he was a very sweet presence overall and um I guess I guess the question I want to ask about that is, and feel free to correct that if that wasn't your experience, but um, is like I sense that Zen training would be a really good idea for some people. Like it was a wonderful thing for you. You were this like intense guy with so much energy, this pressure cooker. And then for some people, it's like maybe not such a good idea. And how do you think about that? And and what what kind of would make it a good idea for someone or not a good idea for someone else? Yeah, yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, I would say back to the Roshi. I think that if you are giving like every fiber to the training, um, he's going to do whatever it, it takes to support that. And um, I think that was my experience. And so like, you know, I was just this, you know, exposed nerve there and, and he could identify and, and help me with that in my particular flavor of, of coming through there. And um he's so scary and intense that like that's all we're there you know what i mean you you know it's there and and so um you know he doesn't have to pull that he doesn't have to pull it and let you know unless unless you forget you know what i mean mm. so you know he he for me yeah, again very um very tender when i when i needed it and very sharp when i you know, you start to kind of, then you kind of get in there when, you, when you're ready, when you're ready, you know? Um, so, so yeah, I think it was like that. It's like that. He, he gives you what you need. 
Mm -hmm. and, and so, so he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he's not like vulgar. He's not, he's like, he's not going to like push somebody who's not ready to be pushed. He's that's, not like a bully or something like that. He's not just mean for the sake of being mean. No, that's right. And, you know, um, so I think that's a, a, it's a little bit, I think it's a little bit sad that, mm -hmm. that link that um, I think people misunderstand, you know, mm -hmm. about that. Um, oh, to be fair to the Roshi, I, it's less like, uh, he seemed like a jerk to me in the descriptions and more like knowing myself. I mean, I have a lot of um, personally, like a lot of background with like fear of anger and um, fear of intensity and, and people shouting or things like this, like just from like basically a trauma background. And so it's less like, oh, I think he's a terrible person and more like, oh, I don't know that that would be helpful for me and, and in a certain way. Yeah. Yes, I hear you. Um, yeah. And um, okay. I would not recommend Zen training to anyone. Don't do it. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, it's, it's, it's do it because you have to do it because like, this is it. I've got to go do it. You know, it's don't go because it's a good idea. That's a, that's a really bad idea. Don't do that. <laughs> and I would say anybody who's got like, um, you know, any kind of, um, uh, maybe they've had some little bit of uh, a mental breakdown or some kind of challenge, I would never recommend that they go because this is a, an environment of, of um, super intensity. And I think that, um, you know, I, I've been very careful about that. I would never recommend that anyone go who's um, uh, maybe any, schizophrenic something like that I would always never go because it's an environment that can actually um, uh, push that if the person doesn't quite understand the environment there it's it's designed um, to be a place of where people can throw their whole lives into it and live their life on the line um, if they're um, if there's this part of them that's pretty pretty um, maybe I, I was I was about on the edge of a, of the person that should go there. I was a mm. very sensitive, very, um, you know, um, yeah. So some some kind of trauma in my background, but um, I was a good fit. But I I would never recommend someone to to go who is is maybe on the edge in that way. I would I would be careful with that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so yeah, I think that's my, that's my feeling about that. Um, and on the other hand, you know, um, I also feel like you got to connect with the teacher. you got to connect with the teacher. And for me, like if that was the used car salesman down here, who was like the guy or the, you know, person and they, they knew it. I think that maybe that's what it should be or the Sufi or the, Christian mystic or Tibetan or, or whatever that I think that finding the teacher is what really matters. Um, mm -hmm. Like, Oh, I connect with that person, that person, he, you know, um, it, and I don't, I definitely don't think that everyone should go to um, a, a, a monastery like that and, and do training. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I answered. Can you please prod me if I if I didn't answer your question? No, you did. You, you answered both of them quite well. And um, I wonder if maybe a, a further question on that is to what extent you think some of this is like cultural, basically, like someone might be a good fit for, say, Japanese Zen or something else, because uh, I mean, to me, it seems like Japanese Zen was designed for the Japanese culture and it I don't know, the way I've been thinking of it is like maybe 10 or 20% of people in a different culture are going to find it to be a good fit for them. But if you're in a different culture, it's like, I don't know, I, I did, I did a, a retreat for a while in Thailand uh, yeah. and I thought it was a beautiful experience. I, I, I was very impressed by Thai Buddhism in certain, certain ways. And it was also very clear. It was like, I am not a Thai person. This is not a tradition that, that resonates for me. The teacher didn't speak to me. I'm sure they were a wonderful, wise person, but uh, it was like, yeah, this is a totally different foreign culture for me. I mean, I was, you know, a millennial 
yeah. teenager from the suburbs in America, which is, you know, a whole culture of its own with its uh, strengths and weaknesses. And uh, it's different. So do you think there's a cultural dimension to these things? Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I know I have a lot to say about that, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I would say a place like Sogenji mm -hmm. is a sort of a bridge to some of that mm -hmm. because it's not the Japanese Soto. Like I had friends who went to the Japanese Soto and that is like high Japanese society. That's like mm -hmm. the most Japanese society of, you know what I mean? Like in terms of formalism and all that, we can't really do that. It, we can't do it. We don't, we, you have to be trained to, to understand that culture. And mm -hmm. Um, I would never be able to do that. And I think so Genji was um, kind of a bridge for that. Um, I would also say, though, that um, like, you know, a lot of us who went there, stayed a long time, got ordained, that I don't think that we are actually Japanese monks. Like, I don't think we really can be Japanese monks. And so um, I do feel like they're there as it comes to, as it spreads to different places, I do feel like it it will have to change and make sense in our home, you know, ground. I think that's going to take a long time, and I hope that it really comes because um, I feel like the essence of the Japanese training is so profoundly deep, and it for it to really translate, I think it's going to take a long time. I don't know that it's quite arrived yet, and that. Um, it's got to, it's got to change. Like, for instance, just to say, like, in, I don't think I've got the book here, but in the capping phrases for um, koan, you do this capping phrase, you, you have taken a poem, and there are all these Chinese poems. And, you know, we don't have any clue what that's about. So um, it, it, it hasn't really, we don't really understand it, but the, the, the real Japanese monks have kind of grown up in some of that. And so, for us at a certain point, those capping phrases will have to be about like Paul Bunyan, you know what I mean? They'll have to be about, you know, whatever, um, George O'Keefe or something, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So they, for it to really get here, it's gonna have to um, um, be be on our ground and, and make sense for us as as wherever we, we're living, Westerners or whatever. Um, I'm a little afraid that it, it won't quite make it. It's gonna take, a long time and that um that maybe that real essence of it is i'm, I'm hoping it makes it mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. you know like, who knows if like the um you know monastic stuff for really work here either you know i think it um the lay practice might be where it's at but i um that has certain challenges that are different than monastic so um yeah mm. big big conversation yeah totally totally um so I feel like we, we've sort of, with your life, we've gotten up to like the koan training, basically. And uh, I'd be curious to hear about the transition sort of out of monastic life. And, and in particular, um, you know, you talked earlier about having this, this sense of almost like obligation to, to give back and be of service and to, to be of benefit to people. And it seems like you've really stepped into that, that you have all these different services that you offer. And I want to talk about those, but what was the kind of transition there in your life and out of the monastery and into kind of a more lay life? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a hard transition. Mm -hmm. it's a hard, it was a hard transition for me. Mm -hmm. um, what happened to me was um, we were there and I was cruising, you know, I was loving it, <laughs> loving the life. And I was ordained. I was just, um, you know, I was the Roshi wanted me to stay another maybe ten years, and um, and then go go teach, and um, and then um, we conceived my daughter mm. there. Wow! So I was like, so so then it was like, you got to go, you got to uh -huh. go, and you gotta figure it out, and. Um, you know, and, and so, so um, that was a huge transition because I've been given, given everything to this training, everything to the Roshi. And then, but, but, you know, the thing about training is that you love it so much, but there's this other aspect of you that, that is real. It's very real. And um, 
So you, you are kind of denying some aspects. I care what we were saying before, like I'm not sure we're really, we can really ever be Japanese monks, you know? Um, and, and so there was a part of me that was like, inevitably was probably gonna come back and be, you know, wear shirts and, and, and you know, ha have a family. And so that part kind of emerged and that part, um, that karma changed. And, um, but that was a hard transition coming from that identity of, okay, I'm giving everything I have to this, to then letting this other aspect, um, which needed expressing, needed to flourish through. And um, that was hard, that was hard. So, you know, um, I got away from the Zen scene for a while. We went for a few years and um, we went to, my, my wife's from Minneapolis who went there for a few years and, um, you know, we were just like fumbling around, clueless, you know, and um, took me a long time. I think when you come out of training, you have this incredible focus, like you're these focusing machines. And um, I had to learn how to be with people. I had to learn how to be with people without causing problems, without giving advice nobody wanted. Mm -hmm. You know, what I, mean? I had to like turn it down and mm -hmm. learn how to bring it when I needed to, you know, kind of like, yeah, and learning how to learning how to be um, be with people and and blend in and and then be helpful, um, and and for me that was a big a big uh, transformation process from being pretty unskillful to slowly um, letting go of some things uh, about about that and then oh kind of maturing a little bit and then oh I, I have some things that can really really help I can I can uh, bring this through and it doesn't feel sticky doesn't feel um, like I'm, um, you know, it's not, it's not some trip that I'm bringing through. So that took me a long time. Took me, I would say it took me um, 15 years to really be, um, okay, I feel pretty good when I present things. I don't feel um, um, sticky hmm. um, or, I'm, or I'm betraying the truth in any way. Um, so see, I was looking for ways to, to be with people and work and, um, yeah, I ended up going into this healing work, um, and um, that was really, uh, okay, like a laboratory for me to be with people. So what happens when, you know, my, my experience with the Roshi and being able to meet another person, and, and then um, I needed to kind of keep exploring that. And so I did that in a healing context with people on, on a table, and um and so I was like, how can I meet that person uh, energetically and in a safe way? And that took me um, further into my process of, of relating with people. That was a really good process. Um, and I started uh, writing the blog and that um, sort of bring in some, pe some people to me through emails and asking questions. And then, um, you know, when the pandemic hit, I, I, um, uh, some people asked me to start teaching some classes. And honestly, that's, that's kind of blossomed into um, uh, a whole a whole international community of practitioners. And um, yeah, it's been really fun. I'm doing these distance sessions. I'm doing in-person. It's, it's really fun. It's, <laughs> it's, it's all part of the same thing. It's all kind of um, relating with people and, and exploring that. So it's it's been a really fun transition. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's been really uh, just need to learn about the different offerings that you have and, you know, have a number of friends that have really found them beneficial. So, oh, um, okay. yeah, and I, I'm, I'm particularly happy that there's, uh, that you offer standing meditation classes because that's been so powerful for me. And I, I think it's, I mean, I imagine it, it, it sounds like you had a monk that sort of helped you with it, but it, it's like helpful to have someone kind of support you in that. So, um, yes, I think it's really helpful to have, Okay, these are all, I mean, it's all self-teaching. Okay, all this stuff is self-teaching, but you do need, you need people to check you. It's mm. good to have people kind of go, okay, um, you know, move your elbow a little bit there. You know, it's nice to have that, but then it of course is self-teaching because we, you know, as we feel into what's happening, oh, that, okay, if I've let go there, something let go. And, and so it, it is a, it is a self-teaching process, but having, um, some people a little bit further along with that can can really have a nice turning point for it. Um, 
so yeah, the um, and the thing about these these classes that have been great is we've been doing these um, month long intensives and boy, people really change. They really um, when you when you have time um, and you you create a safe environment, people really start to change. So that's been really fun. It's been mm -hmm. really I've been so blessed to be able to just um, be kind of a, a helpful brother mm. in that way. Mm. Yeah. 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 I love that description just because, um, yeah, I mean, it, I'd be curious to hear how you see this, but I mean, especially having worked with the Roshi on like the Roshi is the Roshi and there's really only one of Shota Harada Roshi in the right. world. Right. Uh, and then you're also offering things to the world and, and how do you, hold that as like, a, uh, do you see yourself as a teacher or like a guide or um, how do you hold that role for people? Yeah, um, that's a interesting, interesting question. And um, it's developing, mm -hmm. it, it develops. I think it, it's kind of gotta, gotta be kind of osmosis. It's kind of gotta develop as it does. And, um, you know, I've got to just, stay with what's actually helpful. Mm -hmm. And I think my work is pretty non-hierarchical right mm -hmm. now. Um, I feel good about that. I've got some really skilled people who are involved, who have been training for a long time, who've been practicing for a long time. So um, I really like that it doesn't have to be all about me. Like mm -hmm. the Roshi, we always say like the Roshi has to look perfect all the time. And mm -hmm. I, I really don't want to have to look perfect all the time. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and, and, and like, um, yeah, no, it's it's um, it's been a pretty pretty cohesive group. I feel like I'm kind of just mostly a facilitator, and then I teach the classes. And um, again, luckily, we've got some people who I trained with in Japan who are involved, um, mm. so they can really be kind of big brothers too for some of these people who are, um, you know, similar to me when I was twenty. You uh -huh. know, uh -huh. you know, kind of, um, yeah. So so. Yeah, I, I, I'm, when I first started, there was a head monk at um, Tahoma. His name is Doyu, um, Mark Albin, and I actually did, did an interview with him, a couple. <clears throat> and um, Yusan was just really amazing, really powerful. And I, I remember feeling like, oh, Tahoma could be really wonderful. Like one day Tahoma could be this place where people could come and heal and do their practice, and um, it can maybe be better than so Genji. So I think all of the, I don't, I'm not sure, you know, but that's that was my feeling about it, and um, and so like a place of healing and a place of training. Um, I'm not sure how it will develop, but I remember feeling that like in the States, maybe we'll, maybe it'll be a little bit different, could even be better for us if, you know, done in a certain way. Hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. You know, so Genji, so Genji is, is a certain animal and it's so powerful. It's so powerful, but um, I don't know. We'll see how it all works here, you know? Sure, sure, <laughs> yeah. And these things yeah. take decades and centuries too. Uh, they, do. they do. They do. Yeah. Okay. Can you can you um, tell me about the different offerings that you currently have and and what they are and how people might work with you? Yeah. Um, so I I work with people in person and. Um, you know, I, I, I started off working and doing this thing called structural integration and I'm a, I gently work with people in their, you know, sciatica or their, you know, their headaches or their um, digestive issues. You know, people have different digestive issues. I work with that. So very simple, um, uh, craniosacral, stuff like that. And then um, I started taking something called Source Point at a certain point, and um, that was with Bob Shry and, and Donna Thompson. And Bob and Donna were Rochester people for like 15 years, and Bob was sort of the cap one of Capelo's main main guys. And um, they were going to take over Rochester as it moved to Santa Fe, and it all sort of imploded. Um, and um, 
anyway, they're, they're really fascinating people. Dawn is sort of this like oracle. You know, she's like kind of this wild oracle. And, and Bob is, he's a painter and they're really interesting. They created this sort of energetic rolfing and um, dealing with the blueprint. Lots of traditions have blueprints and Source Point is, is one of them. And what Source Point did for me was it, it gave me some permission to start to engage in a, a deeper energetic way with my um, people I encountered in my healing work. So it started, it, it allowed me the permission to um, communicate in a deeper way energetically with people. Um, so what I do in-person stuff, I do distance sessions, which I, I would never would have done. Like, oh, I'm not gonna do distance sessions, but the pandemic hit and then people started requesting them and I found them to be really powerful, like almost more powerful than in-person sessions. Can you can you just describe what those are? I've read your description, and I have to tell you, if this was anyone other than you, I'd be like, "Oh, this is this is crazy." But you know, yeah. um, your earnestness and, and and truth really comes through in your writing, and certainly talking to you. So, would you mind just describing for people that haven't read the description what what those are? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I mean, you become very familiar with um, energetic field and stuff through through practice. Okay, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm had that okay i'm dealing with an energy field here that's clear and then um i would do something like you know craniosacral and at a certain point i'd get a little bit lost like i don't know what's going on here at a certain point and the the source point has um it has um points to work with the energetic field of the body etc and that energetic field is based it it the the body emerges out of this blueprint of information. Okay, if you listen, if you kind of buy into this. And, um, and so, like, so here's, here's Bob and Donna's book. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so you're, so you're dealing with this information through these points and through the body. And that is what does the work. So there's you, the person in this field, and that field is what actually does the, the work. And so you don't have to be in person to do that. If you can feel the field, you can work with it. Then um, what I do is I have a picture of them and I talk to them first, and then I work with that. And I'm interacting with where they're stuck in their body. I, I work with it, I feel it. Oh, that, that arm is stuck. And I clarify that, and then um, they feel that, and and it, and it works with it. So in a way, it's deeper than I'm here talking to them, and they're telling me about the story about their arm. It, it can be actually deeper to work just purely with the energetic field. I found that, um, which was kind of a big leap for me. I had to really um, trust that for a while, and then I saw results happening. So yeah. So yeah, I've never, I'm kind of a rubber hits the road kind of guy. <laughs> uh, uh, what else am I doing? I'm doing these, um, you know, private Qigong classes. So people, you know, they, they, they write me an email and then we, we just do the classes in person, like in person or on Zoom, something like mm -hmm. that. And those are great. Um, you know, some people don't want to come to a class. I get that. It's great. Um, and then I do these like porch talks. Um, this is sort of like Etso Genji, you're, you're doing your training and you really need someone to talk to about mm. um, some energetic thing that's happening for you. Or just in general, you need like a buddy, maybe an older brother to kind of, um, okay, I'm working on this. And, and, and so that's, that's the porch is sort of like the Ingawa in Japan. We, we need that. I think us, um, a lot of people like me, we really, I really needed that. And, and so people, um, I think the blog really brought a lot of people to me. And so that um, people, oh, this person has, has a unique way of talking about this, that I think could be helpful. And so I get a lot of those and they're really fun. Mm -hmm. They're really fun and they're really sweet. And um, yeah. So, so someone would say, come and they would say, well, I'm, even I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble relating with people in my practice. Mm. And, and, and so then we start to just feel into and talk about, well, 
how can I really be with people energetically? How can I relate with them? And, and where is it that I'm putting a barrier up between myself and my colleagues at work? Something like that. So, yep, that's, mm -hmm. I think that's mostly what I do. Mm -hmm. And then classes, of course. These yeah, what, what are the different uh, online mm -hmm. group classes that you have? Yeah, they're, they're all kind of the same. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> I do the morning ones that are, um, I think, so they're morning here. Most of my people are in Europe. Mm. So um, like 8 a.m. Pacific time, we do these um, classes and they're usually the mixed modality. And that just means that we're going through a few different things. Like we'll do some ZZ, some Qigong of some movement, and then some non-directed. Mm. And I really like those. We do a lot. People really um, get a taste of how to open up. And, um, and then the... The afternoon classes are um, like there's a, a jam dong one that's just we go a little further, like it you turn it up a little bit and we go a little longer in postures and it's a little more advanced. And the the non directed one is also an afternoon one. And that one we do some ZZ and then we um, we go a longer time in the non directed, which I find very valuable. And I don't recommend that one to everyone to start because, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit strange for people often to, to stand without any agenda for, um, 35 minutes, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's what they are. Um, and, and we always kind of have a little time at the end uh, to chat and, uh, say, Oh, this is coming up. And, uh, usually they're, again, they're just, it's a fantastic group. So it's, it's real safe and people often have something really good to say. And, um, yeah, it's there. And I I kind of thought, you know, you, you can't do these classes on Zoom. Mm. You know, that's just, that's, you can't do that. It's not going to come through, but they, they do. Mm -hmm. they, it's, it's amazing. So they're powerful. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so we're doing these intensives right now. They're a month long. I'm in the middle of one about the end. And um, that's been just amazing. Um, you know, you give people the opportunity to practice and they run with it. Mm -hmm. You know, they create it. The momentum starts with people. And, um, and so the weird thing that's come out of the, um, the intensives is we do these rooms on Facebook. Okay. Mm -hmm. Totally strange, but there's a group of people in this group. And then there are ways you can click on a room and it's a video call. And right now there are five people in a room mm. who are all over the world sitting or doing their standing together. And again, you think, oh, that would be weird, but they're awesome. Mm. They're awesome. So um, that's been a way for it to tie together when we're not in class. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. I, I, last year, I, one of the big goals I had last year was to learn the soon Tai Chi form online and it was all in Zoom classes. And, you know, um, certainly in person would have been better, but I was surprised at how well, you know, I could do with with the online. And so, yeah, it's not as good as in person, but not as bad as you'd think either. And I imagine it's the same for for yeah. what you're able to offer. And, um, and also that it makes it available to so many people, different time zones, different places. It's just such a gift. Yeah. I know, that's yeah. right. That's right. Well, that's awesome. Who'd you learn that from? Uh, his name is Stanwood Chang. I had him on the podcast a while ago, and uh, yeah, he's wonderful, wonderful Tai Chi and Qigong teacher. So, yeah, awesome. yeah. Um, well, we've covered so much territory. Is there anything else that you want to talk about or say more about? Or no? Um, okay. Yeah. No. Thank you. And um, yeah, thanks for having me on and the opportunity. Yeah, my pleasure. I I I, I really appreciate it because. You know, I, I love your writing and you cover so many things and also, you know, your personality really comes through in a beautiful way there, but it's just so lovely to go over these things, uh, you know, with a live speaking person uh, that no piece of writing could do. So I really appreciate you taking the time to, to share with me and everyone that's listening. Yeah. Great. great. Well, yeah, it's my pleasure. And thanks. Thanks everyone for sitting through it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I think they'll enjoy it. So yeah. Well, thank you, Corey. Okay. Thank you. All right.